Hi everyone, it's Calculus by Christy, and if you're wondering how to get a five on the AP Calculus exam, it first starts with knowing your content. And in this video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know for unit six, and namely these important five topics. So let's get to it. The first is knowing how to approximate area with Riemann sums and trapezoids. So unit six is where we first see this concept of trying to determine the area under a curve. Well, instead of jumping right into finding the exact area under a curve, we first talk about how we can approximate the area under a curve using common geometric shapes, such as rectangles, also known as Riemann sums, and trapezoids. The most common Riemann sums that you're going to see are your left Riemann sums and your right Riemann sums. And in this example, I've shown you how to draw in a left Riemann sum and a right Riemann sum. Again, in Riemann sums, we use rectangles. So in this example, I have given some random function f of x over the interval from 1 to 7, and I've used three rectangles. So over the interval from 1 to 7 with three rectangles, that would give each base a length of 2. Now, a left Riemann sum would then have a rectangle where its height is determined by the height on the left side of the rectangle. So you can see in this picture, all of the heights are determined by where the function is connected to the rectangle on the left end. Whereas in a right Riemann sum, the height of each rectangle is determined by where we attach to the function on the right side of the rectangle. And so what we would do to define a right Riemann sum is we simply add up a whole bunch of rectangles. In this case, we simply need to add up three rectangles. So you need to remember that the area of one rectangle is base times height. So this notation right here means the exact area under the f of x curve between one and seven. But since we're just approximating it, I use this notation here to say the exact area under the f of x curve between one and seven is approximately equal to, now this first rectangle has a base of two, and the height would be f of one, because again, the height would be determined by the height on the left end. Likewise, the second rectangle would be two times f of three, and the third rectangle, two times f of five. Now, because each of these three rectangles do have a base of two, you could factor out the two in front and write this as two times the quantity f of one plus f of three plus f of five. Now over here in the right Riemann sum, to approximate the exact area under the curve, you would do something similar, except that your function values of f of one, f of three, and f of five would now be f of three, f of five, and f of seven, because we are using the heights on the right ends. Again, because each rectangle has a base of two, you could factor out that two as a greatest common factor and write that in front to simplify your work just a little bit. One thing you may be asked about is whether this Riemann sum would give you an over or an under approximation. As we see from these left rectangles that are drawn in, we are missing this area under the curve that we have not added up. And over here in the right Riemann sum, we've added this extra area above the curve. And this is all because of whether f of x is increasing or decreasing. So in order to determine whether a left or right Riemann sum would give you an over approximation or an under approximation of the exact area, that all depends on whether f of x is increasing or decreasing. And in the example I have given you, f of x is increasing. So as we see, if f of x is increasing, a left Riemann sum gives an under estimate or under approximation, whereas a right Riemann sum sum would give an over approximation. Now, if I had drawn in a function that was decreasing, it would be just the opposite. So if f of x was decreasing, a left Riemann sum would give an overestimate, whereas a right Riemann sum would give an underestimate. So I would definitely remember these rules, or at least be able to draw them to know whether you have an over or under estimation. The other Riemann sum is going to be a midpoint Riemann sum, and then also we can approximate area using trapezoids. So here you can see I've drawn in a midpoint Riemann sum, which are rectangles where the height is determined by the height of the midpoint of the base. And then here we have trapezoids drawn in. As you can see, midpoint Riemann sum and trapezoidal sums are gonna give us a little bit closer to the actual area under the curve, a better approximation. 
you would set up a midpoint Riemann sum similar to a left or right Riemann sum with thinking about you're adding the area of each rectangle where each rectangle is made up of base times height plus base times height, et cetera. But now the heights are going to be the heights in the middle of each base. So here we can see the base would be two and the height would be F of two because that's the value right in the middle. So as you can see, this is how you would set up a Riemann sum where you're having a midpoint Riemann sum. Again, each base is two, so you could factor that two out. For a trapezoidal sum, you do need to recall from geometry what is the formula for the area of one trapezoid. And the area formula for one trapezoid is one half times the height of the trapezoid times the sum of the two bases. So in our graph, one half times h, the height of the trapezoid would be the same as this length you see right here. And then base one plus base two would be the height of each of these two sides of your trapezoid. Now because every single trapezoid of these three trapezoids in my picture will all have a one half and a height of two, I have went ahead and factored out the one half times two. Then what I have shown inside is I have added base one plus base two of the first trapezoid, base one plus base two of the second trapezoid, and also of the third trapezoid. And you can actually simplify this even easier if you wanted to write f of one plus two times f of three, plus two times f of five, and then plus f of seven. Again, these are all ways to approximate the exact area under the curve of f of x. Now again, just like left and right Riemann sums, we could talk about whether those were over or under approximations. We can do the same for midpoint Riemann sums and trapezoidal sums, except this time, it doesn't depend on whether f of x is increasing or decreasing. It depends on the concavity of f of x. In this problem, we have an f of x that is concave up. And as we see, if f of x is concave up, a midpoint Riemann sum would actually give you an underestimate of the true area under the curve, whereas a trapezoidal sum, as you can see, just gives slightly an overestimate. If f of x would have been concave down, it would have had been just the opposite, where a midpoint Riemann sum would give you an overestimate and the trapezoidal sum would give you an underestimate. So understanding those over, approx over or under approximations is something that might come in handy for that AP exam. All right, that is it for approximate an area using Riemann sums and trapezoidal sums. Let's move on to the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is made up of two parts. So here is one of the parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If f of x is the antiderivative of f of x, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative evaluated at the upper limit minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit. So once again, notice that this capital f of x is the antiderivative, which means lowercase f of x would be the derivative of capital f of x. Now with some slight manipulation, you can see that I can add over this f of a to this side and have f of b equals f of a plus the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Sometimes this is called the net change theorem. And this is helpful when you want to find the final amount of something and therefore you're going to take the initial amount and then add on the accumulated change. So this is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus allows you to find the derivative of an integral. So if we wanna take the derivative of an integral, first you wanna make sure that you have a constant as your lower limit, and then in your upper limit, you would have some expression that uses x. Afterwards, you would have some function that would have a different variable, oftentimes t. To find the derivative of an integral, you simply take the upper limit, whatever that expression may be, and you're going to replace every t in your f of t function with that expression. So in this case, we would simply have f of x. Lastly, even though I haven't shown it, you would wanna multiply by the derivative of the upper limit, but since the derivative of this upper limit is just one, I have not shown that. But keep that in mind in case that's something such as five x or something more complicated, you would need to multiply by five in that case or the derivative of whatever that upper limit is. 
Next, I want to go through some common properties of definite integrals that you would want to make sure you know. Now remember, a definite integral is where you are given the a and b values or the lower and upper limits of your integral, whereas an indefinite integral, you would not be given those upper and lower limits. The first property of a definite integral you want to make sure you know is the sum of two integrals. So in this example, we have that a is less than b is less than c. And if you took the integral from a to c of f of t dt, that would be equal to the integral of a to b, where b is between a and c, of f of t dt, plus the integral from b to c of f of t dt. Because remember, this means the area under the f of t curve. So if you went from A to B and then added the area from B to C, that would be equivalent to adding the entire area from A to C. Next up is what if you don't like the order of those limits or you really like to put the lower limit on the bottom and the higher number on the top and you'd like to switch those limits of integration. You can do that as long as you make the integral negative. Next is what if you have the integral of a sum or difference? Well, the integral of a sum or difference is equal to the sum or difference of the two integrals. That comes in handy a lot when you're using techniques for anti-differentiation. Number four property of integrals is what if you had an integral from a to b of some constant times f of t dt? Well, in case it makes anti-differentiation easier, you can take that constant and bring it right out in front of that integral. And then lastly, what if you were taking the integral from a to a of f of t dt? Well, since an integral represents the area under a curve from one x value to another x value, and if that x value is staying the same, you haven't accumulated any area. So that integral would be equal to zero. Next up is common antiderivatives that you want to make sure that you know for that AP calculus exam. The first common antiderivative you want to make sure you know is that the antiderivative of some constant k would be kx plus c. And the way you can always check this is because if you took the derivative of kx plus a constant, you would just get k. So that's a common antiderivative you want to make sure to remember. The next one you'll want to make sure you know is how to take the integral of a power. So in order to find the antiderivative of a power, you would want to add one to the exponent and divide by that same exact number. And again, don't forget to add that constant every time you take an integral. Next, a common one to know is that the integral of one divided by x dx is going to be equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Another one you wanna make sure you know is the integral of e to the x dx. Now this is the easy one because if the derivative of e to the x is itself, then the antiderivative of e to the x is also e to the x, but plus a possible constant. The last antiderivatives you wanna know are all of the trig antiderivatives. And I encourage you to pause the video here, write these down or make flashcards. You wanna make sure to know these. Now I hope you actually already know these because if you know your derivatives, then you should know your antiderivatives because you're just working backwards. So the top most common ones to know are that the antiderivative or the integral of sine of x dx is negative cosine x plus c and the integral of cosine x dx is sine x plus c but i would make sure that you know each and every one of these on the screen right now all right lastly i'd like to go through u substitution and U substitution is a very helpful technique when you need to find antiderivatives. And what the U substitution does is it reverses the chain rule. So the chain rule is something we know and love, and that's if you are taking the derivative of a function where you have a composite function. So you've got this function inside of another. To review the chain rule, as we know, we take the derivative of the outside function and then we have to use the chain rule right here, which means to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So what if you now were to take that derivative and put it right here into your integral? Well, then the antiderivative would be, you just return to here, f of u of x plus c. Of course, remember that constant. So u substitution is a technique where you need to identify your inner function. 
Then what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of that inner function and we'd like to see that show up somewhere in the problem. Let me go ahead and walk you through an example such as this where you would want to use u substitution to integrate. First, you need to identify your u. Now a common place to find your u in this case is in an exponent. Sometimes it may be in an exponent, in parentheses, inside of a trig function, in a denominator, all of those places to definitely look for. So in this case, the u is going to be the exponent. Next, you're going to take the derivative of u with respect to x, and in this case, we can see that it is 2. From here, people from here solve it in different ways. What I like to do is I like to try to form what is left over here, and I have a 2, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the dx over, and I can see that du is going to be equal to 2 dx. Well, right now I have a six. So what if I did this? What if I brought a three out in front and then had an two e to the two x dx? And you can see here that three times two would still give me six, so I'm not changing the problem. But now I can see the du of two dx right here. So I can substitute the two dx with a du, keep the three out in front, and now e to the power of 2x would now be e to the power of u du. And this is an integral that we do know. It was one of our common antiderivatives to know. I showed you that the integral of e to the x was e to the x plus c. And in this case, my antiderivative would be e to the u plus c or 3e to the u plus c. Lastly, you want to make sure to replace your u with what you determined was your u from the beginning. So my final antiderivative of it is 3e to the 2x plus c. And that is how to do one example using u substitution. Let me walk through another. In this problem, I have a trig function. Again, a common place you could find your u is inside of a trig function. So that's what I'm going to make my u be in this example. I'm going to set u equal to 4x plus 7. Next, I need to find the derivative of u with respect to x, and here we can see that the derivative would just be 4. Well, in this problem, I don't see a 4 anywhere other than, you know, this part that I made my u. So I'm actually going to divide this 4 over and write this as 1 fourth du, and then I'm going to multiply this dx over. So instead of dx here, I'm going to substitute it with 1 fourth du. So this is going to become 1 fourth du, and this is going to become u. And as I rewrite this, I like to take any constant and bring it out in front of the integral. That was one of the properties that we discussed in number three. So 1 fourth will come out here, and then that would be the integral of sine of u du. And this is a common antiderivative that you need to make sure you know. And the antiderivative of sine of u is negative cosine u. So this would give me negative 1 fourth cosine u, and then don't forget that plus c. Last step is replace 4x plus 7 with u. So a final answer of negative 1 fourth cosine of 4x plus 7 plus c. And those are a couple examples where you would need to use u substitution to find an integral. I hope you found this video helpful to help you with everything from Unit 6 on the AP Calculus exam. If you did, make sure to give it a like, and if you haven't subscribed already, consider subscribing for future math videos. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye!